Good morning. Good morning, good morning. How's everybody? We're doing good. Go ahead and grab a seat. We're going to get started this morning at Grace. I want to welcome you to Grace Church. Come on in. We've got plenty of room down here on the floor, or you can sit in the back, whatever you're comfortable with. This is a, it's a great opportunity for us here in Hot Springs. We're excited about what God's doing at Grace. I just want to encourage you this morning to open your heart up. This is a call to worship. So we come in here from all of our busy lives and the things that we're doing, and I want you to make a decision this morning to open your heart up to what the Lord has for us through the word, through our worship, through the coming to the table. So I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Y'all go ahead and get settled. We'll have a we'll have an opportunity for our kids to go to kids' church and then a sermon, and we'll continue to worship and come to the Lord's Supper. Today is the second day of Advent, and so Advent is a season, and the word Advent means anticipation or coming, and so we anticipate the coming of Christ on Christmas morning. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle, which is the candle of hope, and this morning, we're going to light the candle of peace and continue to read the scriptures about the anticipation of the coming of Christ on Christmas night. We will have a Christmas Eve service here on Christmas Eve. We will not have a Christmas Day service on that Sunday. So Christmas Eve service will be here. It'll be a candlelight service. We'll light our last candle of Advent, and then we'll all have Christmas with our families on Christmas morning. And we also will not have a service on New Year's Day. New Year's Day is on Sunday. I'll I'll record a message, and... uh, this place will be rocking Christmas Eve night, and it won't be ready for us on Christmas morning, on New Year's Day. So, <laughs> but uh, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll light our candle this morning. Father God, we we gather in Your name. We gather. We come. We're scattered. We come from so many different places and things this week, and yet we can descend here. And as, as we gather, You come with us, and Your Holy Spirit fills this place. And Father, we thank You for Your faithfulness to us. And that we can come this morning and open up our hearts and you have something for each of us. We believe that you have orchestrated this service through music and candle and scripture and the Lord's Supper, your supper you provided for us. Father, we, we pray that you would speak to us in your, your, your way, in your time. We love you. We thank you for Grace Church. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have the Redmond family coming up to light the candle. So light our candle and read our scripture for us this morning. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. God, we just want to worship you today. You're so worthy of our praise. You're worthy of honor. We know without you, we are nothing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Blind, but now I see. 
sing that again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace oh unending It's always good to remember where we came from, you know, that every one of us was bankrupt without God, that he covered our sin, that his grace and his mercy covered us. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your mercy over our lives. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbid to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be Forever mine, you are forever mine. This is an old song that um, I sang as a kid. Maybe some of you will remember it. It's just a chorus. It goes like this: Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin, grace, grace, God's grace, 
grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all my sin i don't know if you'll know this song but um there's nothing wrong with just soaking in god's presence even if you don't know the words just to um, let's just uh, come into this place of just his presence. The chorus goes like this. When I bow down before you, I am richer than all kings. When I stand in your presence, I am free. This world was for the taking, and every treasure known was mine. Not one of them would ever sway me. I choose my Savior every time when I bow down. Stand in your presence, I am free. When I sit at your table, I am right where I belong in the 
doorway of my Father's house. I'm home. Wherever I go, I'm home. You're here in my soul. You're an oasis in the desert, living water overflow. Wherever I go, I'm home. You're here in my soul. You're an oasis in the desert, living water overflow. I'm home. I'm Word of God says, whoever loves me and obeys my commands, I and my Father will come and make our home with them. Isn't that good? I want you to be able to feel comfortable if you need to sit down or stand, it's fine, just, just to be in His presence. Through it. 
it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well, it is well. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. So let go, my soul, and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. The waves and wind still know his name. It is with. Mm, good, good moment there. Love it. I hope you can feel God's presence here. He is faithful to us. This is an opportunity for us to bring dollars to the Dollar Tree. We have a dollar club, and so if our kids are here and have a dollar, come bring one up, and then they can be dismissed into Children's Church. All right. Thank you. Right there. Perfect. Hey, Max. <laughs> so our, our dollar club is a reminder to us, and this olive tree uh, is a symbolic tree. As our kids bring dollars up, it's a reminder to us that we are here in Hot Springs to give back to our community, to bless our community. And uh, this is a reminder to us, our dollar club is dollars that are given to grace that are going to go to bless our community in, in significant ways. And not only just in giving, but also giving up our time and our effort and our energy and our passion. Um, so this is just a reminder of that. And last uh, Thanksgiving, we did a downtown at the Transportation Depot. We got to give away a lot of stuff. We got to use our dollars to buy food and supplies, and people brought food, and we, we served. We served those who wanted a meal or needed a meal, and it was a great opportunity. Um, but as I told you, that's just the beginning. We're going to do it again on Christmas Day. So we're excited to go back to that same spot. I got a little bigger spot, hopefully, this year um, at the uh, where they have the farmer's market. And um, we're going to do it again. And so if you want to help us on Christmas Day, there's two opportunities. We're going to have a shift it from 9 to 11. Come help serve from 9 to 11, set up and serve, or come from 11 to 1. Uh, just two hours on Christmas Day. If you can give us two hours, bring your family down there. We're going to be singing hymns. We're going to be serving food. We're going to be giving away camping supplies, clothes, canned goods, and just bless our community again. It's very symbolic to what we want to do and how we want to exist here in uh, Hot Springs. We want to bring heaven to Hot Springs, in Hot Springs as it is in heaven. And so we're looking forward to doing that again on Christmas Day. Sign up back there and join us if you can. That'd be, that would be great. Um, we have uh, ways that you can give to, to grace, but let me just say something about giving, and let me say something about uh, salvation. Um, we don't want to um, cause you to, to give uh, reluctantly. We don't want you to pray to receive Christ out of guilt, or we don't want to manipulate you to do something like that. 
we want you to give because you want to give. And so we have a little giving kiosk back there. We have ways you can give online. But we also, if you want to know about Christ, if you want to know the gospel, call me. I've got a little business card back there. I would love to sit down and show you the scriptures and show you how to become a Christian if you're not a Christian. Um, I don't want to manipulate into that decision. I would love to instruct you into that decision because it's an important decision. Just like giving. Giving's important. We don't want to do that out of, uh, out of guilt or manipulation. We want to do it because we're excited about giving. You know, grace isn't interested in your money. Grace is interested in God having your heart. That's the difference. And when God has your heart, grace doesn't have to worry about giving. That's the way it works. And so we're, we're, we're confident of that. And that's just how we're going to operate here at Grace. We want it to be free. We want you to feel loved. But we have a plan, and God has a plan for your life in, in terms of giving and salvation. And so we would love to tell you more about it if you're interested. Well, it's time to go to the Word. Uh, let's do that this morning. We're going to look at the word peace. Uh, this is a very important message for me personally today. Uh, God has really been working in my heart this week and this year in regards to peace. So uh, I might get a little emotional this morning, but it's coming from a, a good place and a, and a deep place in my own heart. And so we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4 as we look at this word peace. But let me set it up by saying this. If you've ever been to Los Angeles, I've been there recently because I have a daughter that lives there. The driving habits in L.A. are a little different than they are in Hot Springs. If you go to L.A., I don't think they put any uh, blinkers or markers on their car that they're going to turn. They don't use the blinker in L.A. They just turn. They just move. They go from lane to lane with no signal. Okay, that's just the way they drive in L.A. And in addition to that, they also drive very aggressively in L.A., a lot more aggressive than they do in Hot Springs. Uh, stop signs are just kind of a suggestion in, uh, in L.A. And um, there's also many, many lanes of traffic in L.A., uh, and you will be in the, maybe from the 405, the most busiest interstate in all of the world, over 500,000 vehicles in a 24-hour period are on this interstate. Um, and all of a sudden, you're on this interstate, and you're caught up with this sea of cars, and really quickly, you realize you're in the wrong lane. And you've got to go four lanes over to get your exit, and you better be able to do it quick. Um, and so when I first got to L.A. with my daughter, I'm learning about all this. And the real, when you look at the people in L.A., they're just used to it. That's, that's, that's their life. They, that's how they live. They're not surprised that you don't use your blinker. Um, they're not surprised that uh, you pull it right in front of them or they in front of you. And so it comes down to this. Now that I go to L.A., I expect it. I'm not frustrated in traffic in L.A. anymore because I expect that's how it is in L.A., right? In Hot Springs, it's not near that way. Uh, it was the great C.S. Lewis who said, expectations are everything. And I, I believe that a lot of us don't have peace and joy today because we have the wrong expectations. Just like if you go to L.A. and you don't expect traffic to be the way it is, you're going to be frustrated. You're not going to have peace. You're going to be angry. You're going to say, I don't want to ever drive here again unless you have the proper expectations. So the proper expectations for life have absolutely help us navigate life, walk through life, and have peace. So let me be truthful to you today. When I look at the scriptures, there's a couple things that I see that are the realistic expectations of life. And these might not be your expectations, and if they're not, then you probably don't have much peace in your life. But if you have these expectations according to the Scriptures, then you're going to find joy, and you're going to find peace, and you're going to find contentment, and you're going to find a lot of things in your life that make sense. But you've got to have the right perspective and expectation. So when I look at the whole of Scripture, I see three things that are in our world today and in our lives that cause challenges and difficulties. The Bible says we live in a world that's fallen. So we have the world. It is a fallen world. It's a broken world. We have the flesh. We have our own flesh, our own sin nature. I sin and I sin against others. Others sin against me. So I have the world that I have to deal with that's broken. I have 
my own self that's broken, my flesh that craves a selfish desires and others crave a selfish desire. And then the third thing is the devil. So we could turn it around and say DFW. That's how I remember it, DFW, okay? So the proper perspective of life biblically is that we live in a world that's broken. We have people that are broken because of sin. And we have a devil, an enemy, who is an adversary. He is against the things of God. He is all about darkness, okay? Now, that is the right perspective, biblically, for a Christian. And I can show you all the scriptures that support that. So we read our text now this morning from Philippians. And so I want you to follow along with me. And Paul, the apostle, says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and with supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's anything, if any, any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the peace will be with you. Grace, this is the word of the Lord. You're better than that. Grace, this is the word of the Lord. Man, it is good to have God's word because this is truth. This is not my ideas. These are God's words and truth for us. So when Paul is writing this, he's not sitting on a beautiful place looking over the Sea of Galilee, having a cabernet and some goat cheese, okay? He's in prison. Paul is in prison chained to the praetorian guard because of sharing the gospel chain meaning he is chained to another soldier he's captive and he's writing these words paul has a different perspective a different expectation for his life and for the world that's how he can write this from prison paul was beaten paul was scourged paul was shipwrecked paul was left alone And he found, he said, I've learned the secret to have contentment in all things. Because he had the right expectation for his life this side of heaven. He said, for me to live and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. That's his perspective of his life. So when you and I have the right expectations for our life, we can find a peace that passes understanding. That's what our scripture says. Passes an understanding. And so let's look at it in detail. I've got three points for you this morning. I want to look at the character of peace. I want to look at the discipline of peace. And then I want to look at the secret of peace. Okay? The character of peace, the discipline of peace, and the secret of peace. First of all, in your outline, the character of peace. I want you to note on your outline that this is not the absence of something, but the presence of someone. When you look at hope, or when you look at joy, the opposite of joy is sadness, or we could say grief. But the opposite of peace is anxiety. The opposite of peace is anxiety or fear. And when people look at anxiety or they look at fear, they oftentimes go to technique. Okay, the technique would be, well, you need a work uh, rest balance in your life in order to have more peace and not have anxiety. Or you need to just stop thinking about that thing that's making you anxious. Just stop thinking about it. We go, so we go to technique. And, and so we, we go to willpower, you know, to uh, you need to work on these breathing techniques. You need to have this type of meditation. You need these techniques in order to relieve the anxiety that you have. And I, I'm not saying all those aren't somewhat beneficial. They, they can be. I, I, I love yoga. I go to yoga and it's relaxing. It helps me. There is, a, there is a calmness about some of those things that are good. 
but they don't suffice with everything we face in this life. And they are a part of the technique, not the whole package. You see, Scripture tells us that what we really need at the very core of who we are is not a technique, but someone, the presence of God. One of the greatest books that was written in the last century was by Brother Lawrence about the presence of God, practicing the presence, okay? Now, this is a discipline. This is a practice, as Brother Lawrence wrote. And the idea is that God is always with us. And so rather than going to a technique or a willpower to control my mind, I have the presence of a God who's always with us. He says, seek me and you'll find me. I will knock on the door and I, I stand at the door and knock and, and I will open. He is ready and available and willing to be in our life. And so what I want to make this point about the character of peace is the idea that in this text, we see that the very beginning, the idea is Paul can rejoice in prison because of who's with him, not the guard, but the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. The Lord is near to Paul. That's where his peace comes from. And so you and I have access to the Father. We have access to the Son. We have access to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, every day, and we can practice his presence in our life. And that is the best antidote to anxiety because he is the Prince of Peace. So when Paul is writing this, I think he's applying it in his own life and has been applying it, and he can speak to it from a personal standpoint and he can say that we don't have to go to a technique, but we have the presence of the living God with us. In the midst of a world that's broken, in the midst of sin, our sin, other sin, and an enemy who doesn't want to see us with peace. He wants to throw a lot of things at us to discourage us and cause anxiety. And you've been there as well as I have. Well, the second point I want to make is that this kind of peace also needs to come from a discipline. And this is why Paul says here, this is something that's learned. Okay, this is something that's learned. And so the discipline of peace has three aspects to it. First, it is thinking. Thinking, how we think. We need to think doctrine. We need to think the truth. Um, you can be anxious if you're thinking about things that aren't true because it's confusing and you, you wonder about it, you're not sure, but you can be confident of truth. You can be confident of doctrine. And that's why the scriptures are so important to us. I'm just going to go through several scriptures that, that I've used in thinking out my way out of anxiety and into peace. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Thy word is a light unto my path. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and you shall be prosperous in everything you do. Blessed is the man or woman who doesn't sit with the, the council, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. Day and night, night and day, he is with us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So thinking the truth, applying doctrine to our mind and to our heart is what Paul is saying is the way to peace. Now, I will tell you, um, I've had a lot of anxiety this year more than I ever have in my life. And the days that I had the most anxiety was when I wasn't thinking doctrine. It was when I was thinking fear or thinking about my security or thinking about what other people were thinking about me. I got lost in anxiety and fear. And that's a horrible place to be. 
And the way I got out of that was to think the truth of what God says in his word and proclaim it over and over and over. The enemy has no power over God's word. That's why Jesus, when he was tempted, what did he do? He quoted the scriptures. He spoke the truth. He thought the truth. So there is a discipline. There's a discipline that's necessary for us if we're going to have peace. It doesn't just come because you're a nice person or you want to be a nice person. It comes through applying God's word to your mind and to your heart. Wayne Dyer said this. He said, peace is the result of retraining your mind to process life as it is rather than you, how you think it should be. And Paul finally says in the same chapter, I've learned to be content in every and any situation because he knows that God's in control. The second part of discipline of peace is thanking. Thanking in advance. Now, this is counterintuitive. This is why it says in our text, if you'll go back to the scriptures here in Philippians 4, what does he say? He says right in the middle of it, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer with supp- supp- and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known. See, oftentimes we will think, well, I will thank after I know God answers me. Because he gives me the answer I want, then I'll thank him. No, it doesn't say that. It says, thank him. This is not saying, thank you, Lord, my mother has cancer. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, thank you for everything you've given me, all the blessings in my life. I'm so grateful, and you actually are grateful, and you look at all those things, and your mother has cancer. And God will answer that in the way that he's going to answer it, but you're going to be thankful regardless. You see the difference? Gratitude is an attitude of the heart. It's a choice that we make. And so we can be thankful to God regardless of getting what we want. And that's why this says it the way that it does. God wants us to be thankful and make our requests made known to him. And be thankful for what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, how he's going to do it. That's a whole different ballgame. That, is, that has to do with the head and the heart being congruent with one another. That's why it says this in the text, head and heart. They have to be connected. And you can't be thankful if you don't have thankfulness in your heart. You can say the words. You can think it. But if you don't believe it, it will show. So that's the second discipline uh, or, that we have to have is first thinking, then thanking in advance and then number three the third part of discipline is loving the right things loving the right things is a key to peace in our life that's why he says in the the latter part of this he goes through the list of in in verse eight notice go with me there he says finally whatever is true Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is lovely of good repute, okay? So disciplining ourselves to love the right things. What happens when we love the wrong things? It creates anxiety. Because anything that we love, if it's a wrong thing, it's going to cause more anxiety because you have a fear of losing it. You, you have a fear of, of something happening to it. You have, some, you have a, a greater fear. And so we can love the wrong things, and it can create a lot of anxiety or fear in our life. We need to love the right things. And that's why the list is there that Paul lists for us. There are lots of good things that we can love. I love community. I love serving. I love seeing you serve. I love worship. I love seeing God work in in hot springs and through other churches. I love seeing his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I want to love those things, and those things bring peace to us because they're things of God. They're things that he he made for us to love, and they're, they're not things of this world. And so let's love those things, and they'll bring more peace and contentment to our life. The third thing that I see here is the secret of peace. If we're going to have peace in our lives, there's a secret to it, and Paul has the 
the secret sauce, and this is, this is it. If you love anything more than God, you'll not find peace. If you love anything more than God, you will not find peace. In our text here, Paul says to guard your hearts. That word guard is a military term. And the idea is that it's an it's a army surrounded around a city. And if you're in a city and you have an army around a city, you know what you do? You sleep well. Guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus and love God more than anything. Now, as I mentioned to you, the, um, this year has been a challenging year for me in some ways, and God has taught me that I didn't love him in some areas that I needed to. Hard lesson. You would have thought I would have had that lesson being a pastor since I was a little guy, right? No. No. You see, I have an enemy, an adversary, who doesn't want me to love the things of God. And I live in a world that's broken, and I have a heart that's broken, and I interact with other people who are broken. And all of those things are the reality of life. And we have such a good God that he wants us to love the right things. And he will allow those things to happen to us so we can love the right things and love him more than anything. And so if you give your heart to anything other than God, you won't have peace. But if you give everything to him and you love him the most, you will find peace in the midst of the worst tragedies, the worst trials that life can throw at you. It doesn't mean it'll be easy. It means he will be with you and you'll see him working and you'll go from that anxious thought, that fearful thought, and I've had them in my little head this year, and Go to the scriptures and go to who you love and go what God's doing and it'll take you right out of it. And you can see and you can have hope. This morning as I was standing down here before I stood up, I felt the peace come over me. It was powerful. It was powerful. That's, that's God. There's no other way to describe it. You know, there's a story, and we just sang a song about it as well, and the story of the song is a phenomenal story. You've probably heard it, but I'll tell it again. The guy who wrote that hymn was named Horatio Spafford. In 1873, he was a real estate mogul in Chicago. And he and his wife, Anna, they lost a son. And there was a Chicago fire around that time, maybe a couple years before, and he lost a lot of his possessions and all of his real estate. And, but he and his wife had planned to go to Europe in, uh, in 19, 1873. And so Anna took the four girls and got on a ship and sailed across the, uh, the sea to Europe. Horatio stayed back in Chicago and was going to join them later. Well, unfortunately, this boat and ship collided with another ship. And all four girls died. Anna makes it to Europe and sends back a message, a telegraph to Horatio, two words, saved alone. So Horatio goes over to Europe. He gets on a ship and goes over there to meet his wife. And somewhere near where the wreck happened, we don't know exactly, but somewhere where that ship where it crashed, where he lost his four girls. He wrote the words, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows go, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. At that point, we grow closer to God. 
Father God, you are so faithful to us. And everyone in this room is broken. We're broken spiritually. We might be broken financially. We might be broken relationally. Everyone is broken. And that's the world we live in. That is reality. But that's not the end of the story. We thank you that we have a father who lost his son who voluntarily gave up his son so that we could have peace and we come now and we take and eat and drink and remember this sacrifice the greatest sacrifice for us bless this table bless this remembrance of you Lord Jesus we thank you your son's name. Amen. Those who are going to serve the Lord's Supper, if you could join me up here. a wretch I remember who I was I was lost and I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your side Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. There at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. 
Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and my life has no end. I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood. The blood that calls the sons and daughters we were ransomed by our Father through Wash me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. I want to thank Brent and Michelle uh, for singing and leading us. Awesome. Uh, Brent and I had a meeting this week. We got together, and um, I want to pray for a church. Uh, we're going to pray for churches in Hot Springs. And uh, he and I have a good friend, John Byers, who's a pastor at First Lutheran. And so I just want to pray for First Lutheran this morning as we go. Let's pray for this church. Father God, we thank you for your church, and we thank you for First Lutheran here in Hot Springs and our brother John Byers. Um, Brant and I love him and just pray for him and his marriage. Father, we pray for his vision, pray for their direction, pray for leadership for him and support, encouragement. Bless this pastor in our city, bless this church, and I pray that what they're doing, what they feel led of you will, will go far for your kingdom. We love you. We're your, king, we're your kids. Your kingdom has no end. May Hot Springs look more like heaven this week. We're dismissed.